Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for uh, the webinar talking about um, superannuation and essentially buying properties uh, with inside self-managed superannuation. Just a quickly general advice warning that uh, what I talk about today, while I may uh, know what I'm saying, you can't actually believe it unless you uh, specifically seek advice on it. Now, I suppose what we're going to be covering today is um, essentially about superannuation, the borrowings of property, and where are we at with, with the legislation. Now, I suppose firstly, just a very quick um, touch base, just a bit of a reminder that superannuation is actually a financial product and as such, uh, when you receive advice on superannuation, it needs to be from a someone who is authorised and licensed. So there are a number of people who are sort of getting into trouble at the moment because they are providing financial advice uh, according to ASIC on buying property inside self-managed superannuation. So to give that sort of advice, as I mentioned, you have to be licensed uh, and you also have to consider if that is the best thing for that individual. Uh, so just something to be aware of that if people are talking to you about buying property, that they are either licensed to do so uh, or that they uh, it's just general advice uh, essentially. <clears throat> and that just basically talks about when people need to be licensed, just so you have that. So I suppose t really the, the main point of today is a bit of an update on the limited recourse borrowing, or borrowing arrangements or the LRBAs. Now some of you may be aware that there was this financial services inquiry undertaken some time ago and as one of their recommendations was to essentially stop borrowing with inside superannuation. Now if we, if we rewind probably about five years now, there was the uh, Henry, uh, sorry, the Murray inquiry into superannuation, and at that time they recommended that we actually wait a couple of years and see where we're at as far as the borrowings go. After that period of time, the government uh, of the day basically said that um, there's no need to change anything, but we'll continue to monitor the situation. Now, as part of the most recent inquiry, into the financial services uh, system. The recommendation was actually made that we, as I say, get rid of the borrowings inside super. Now, interestingly, um, as I understand it, the uh, Abbott-led government was finalising their response to the inquiry and they were actually going to announce that the limited recourse borrowing arrangements would stop inside self-managed superannuation. But with the change of Prime, Minister, Prime Ministership and obviously leader of the coalition, that was essentially removed and changed. So now what they're basically doing is more of a, a laissez-faire approach where at this stage, they're really adopting the same approach they did five years ago. And that's where we're just gonna monitor the situation and um, have a look at it in three years time now. So what does that really mean? Well, basically it means that we have a status quo. So nothing changes. Um, the arrangements can continue uh, at this stage until such time as another three years are up and we have, a, when we have another look at it. So essentially that provides a lot of certainty for those that have arrangements and those that are looking to enter into arrangements. Uh, which is obviously a good thing because there's always a lot of uh, scepticism around superannuation and about the um, the changes that uh, that occur. So having some consistency, particularly with something as important as as borrowing money to buy a large asset such as property, is can only be a good thing. So a bit of a back to basics: borrowing with inside superannuation is essentially prohibited. So the legislation actually says that you cannot borrow inside superannuation unless it is for a certain number of exemptions. So that's to pay a benefit, so essentially either a pension or a lump sum to a member, so long as that is no more than 10% of the value of the assets and it's for no longer than 90 days. So typically that's more for the, 
the large APRA funds or the public offer funds that may have had a bit of a run, their assets are all tied up in investments and they don't really have any liquidity there. They can actually borrow to pay out the, the members. Uh, to pay the tax office, funnily enough, once again, you can borrow for up to 10% of the value of the assets and for no longer than 90 days. And there's also one there for covering share placements. So once again, that 10% rule applies, but it's only for seven days. So if you unexpectedly uh, were short on cash for, for shares, you can actually borrow for a small period of time there. And finally, and I suppose most obviously, limited recourse borrowing arrangements is the other exemption to that borrowing prohibitation. So what does, it, what does that limited recourse borrowing arrangement mean? Well, essentially, you're borrowing money with inside or from the super fund is borrowing money to acquire an asset. Under the legislation, it's actually known as a single acquirable asset. And I'll touch on really what that means in a second. Now, particularly with these arrangements, they have to be structured in a particular way. So in other words, that asset needs to be held on trust so that the self-managed super fund acquires a beneficial interest in that asset and that the self-managed super fund has a right to acquire legal ownership of the asset by making one or more payments. So in other words, paying the loan out. Now, you'll notice there that I am referring to self-managed super funds with, with talking about these limited recourse borrowing arrangements, and that's because they are only al allowed for self-managed super funds. Now, with these arrangements, you can only have one property per structure. So in a minute, I'll, I've got a little bit of a diagram as to how that structure looks. And you can actually have, oh, sorry, and the loan must be what's called limited recourse. In other words, if the trustee fails to actually repay the bank uh, or the, the lender, and that lender then exercises their right as mortgagee in possession to sell the property, they only obtain proceeds from the sale of the property. So that if you have other shares or other cash inside the self-managed fund, they can't access any of those other assets. The way the banks normally protect themselves in those situations, however, is they have personal guarantees in place, which is allowed. Now, multiple lenders uh, are allowed, as well as related party borrowings. So these arrangements aren't limited to banks lending into self-managed super funds. A related party, so either a member or, or a company, a trust, whatever it may be, can actually lend into the self-managed super fund. And that can be on top of a bank uh, also lending to the fund. Now, those related party arrangements, they have to be as if it is a normal arm's length transaction. So in other words, as if you're going to the bank and saying, hey, I want a mortgage or a second mortgage, what deal will you do for me? It has to be as close as to those terms as you can physically get. So it's important that um, that's, that is the case because otherwise the tax office have held a public position that they will treat any income derived by that self-managed super fund as non-arm's length income, which is taxed at the top marginal tax rate of uh, 47%. So obviously not an ideal situation. Uh, the, the paperwork and the timing of how things work and are executed uh, differs from state to state. So it's important that you actually engage with someone who knows what they're dealing, what they're doing and dealing with in relation to that particular transaction. And finally, the deposit must come from the super fund. And the reason for that is purely for stamp duty purposes to evidence that the super fund was the essentially was the beneficial owner from the outset. So that way there's no double stamp duty on the eventual payout of the loan and transferring of the property from that bare trust arrangement back to the self-managed superannuation fund. Now most of you may have seen this diagram before, uh, it just talks about the borrowing structure. So essentially on the left hand side there in the green box you have the lender lending to the self-managed super fund in the middle which then acquires the property via a trust. Now, these trusts have different names, and I think I've captured most of them there. So, Bear Trust is the most common, 
but also a holding trust or a security trust are the other two most common types of names that these trusts are called. Now it's important to note that these trusts, there's no tax return, there's no financial statements. Essentially they don't exist from a day-to-day -day point of view. The only time that you actually may remember the, that they're there is that they have a corporate trustee, so when ASIC sends you out the annual uh, review letter and fee, and also when you receive your rates notice, because the rates notice will actually be in the name of that bear trust, because that is the, the physical owner or the legal owner. The beneficial owner is the super fund. So what is a single acquirable asset? Essentially, it's an asset that is, um, it's one thing. Now, that may sound a little bit simplistic, when, particularly when you're talking about property. But the thing to remember is that sometimes you can have multiple titles for a property. So working through some examples on that, you may have a building that is across multiple titles. So the, say a factory that sits across multiple titles, that's actually one asset, even though you have multiple titles. And the thing to remember is that they can't be disposed of separately. So that's the, I suppose, really the, the easiest way to, to think about what a single acquirable asset is. They're either, it's an asset that can't be sold separately to another type. So the so a car park, for argument's sake, with an apartment, that has to be on the one title. So you, you, you're not allowed to have the ability to essentially sell off the car park and then still, remain, still uh, maintain the apartment. If you have those sort of situations where they're on separate titles, then you actually need to bear trust because they are separate assets. So think of about a furnished apartment that you acquire using borrowed monies. All those furnishings, so the chairs, the tables, the couches, whatever it may be, they're actually separate assets and would and technically need to be held inside separate bear trust type structures. Very painful. And look, there are ways to get around situations like that. So these rules only apply to where there are borrowings for that asset. So in the case of the furnished apartment, what you would do is you would pay less of a deposit and that and those proceeds would be physically physical cash using to purchase the furnishings and then the apartment is the one that actually has the borrowings against it. So it's just about how you actually structure it. Um, a single acquirable asset is not farmland with multiple titles because obviously you can sell those separate titles and also building on a vacant block of land. So if you buy the block of land using borrowing, using borrowed monies, you can't then put a building on top of it um, because that is not a single acquirable asset. <clears throat> now borrowed monies can maintain or repair a property but they can't, and which that definition is a little bit different than what you may be used to as far as tax law goes. So maintain and repair can actually be doing things like preventing defects, damage or deterioration, and also in anticipation of future defects. So it can even be something like replacing a roof. So under tax law, that would actually be an improvement because you might be using different materials or something like that. However, under the, the CIS regulations, replacing a roof would actually be um, a, a repair or a maintenance. So that's, that's allowed, even using borrowed monies. And I suppose the thing to remember too is that the borrowed monies can be uh, used for a now um, renov a repair or maintenance or at a later time. So in other words, you could buy a, a house that's in need of some TLC and use those borrowed monies to actually affect that maintenance or repair of that property. With inside the, um, the, the framework that we have for these limited recourse borrowing arrangements is this notion of functional efficiency. Now what that essentially means is that what you have at the start has to be what you have at the end after you've done the maintenance or repair. If you have more than that, then you have an improvement. So say that you bought that, that fix up house, 
if you then put another bedroom on, that's an improvement. So that means that you no longer have a functional efficiency of say a three bedroom house, now you have a four bedroom house. If you replace the kitchen, keep it in the same spot, that sort of thing, that's fine. That's a repair or maintenance. So repairing is essentially restoring the functionality of the asset without changing its character. So as I mentioned, this notion of functional efficiency. So where does, where does that grey line land between improving and repairing? So the functional efficiency, if it increases the value, uh, or if that functional efficiency is just increased, so as I mentioned, three bedroom to four bedroom, then it's an improvement. And you can't actually use borrowed monies to improve an asset. So what you can actually do is you can use cash reserves with inside the self-managed super fund to affect those sort of uh, improvements. But you need to be very careful with that because if you fundamentally change the character of that asset so it becomes a different asset, then the borrowing, basically you fall foul of the borrowing rules. So for argument's sake, if you had a house that was a three bedroom house, you demolished it and then built up a 10 storey uh, apartment block, then you fundamentally change the character of that asset. So therefore it's a replacement asset, it's different. By going from a three bedroom to a four bedroom, that's an improvement. So you can do that just without borrowed monies though. So it can be a bit of a grey area and it's certainly something that you should seek um, advice on before going down that path. Because what it could ultimately mean is if you fall foul of the borrowing rules and the exemptions thereof, um, you can essentially be forced to have to sell the property. Now actually, um, I've just got a question here in relation to the setup costs for the super fund, uh, sorry, for the Bear Trust and that corporate trustee. Now certainly, yes, you the super fund can pay for those costs. There are a legal expense uh, of the um, of the structure. So your only the only reason you're entering into the Bear Trust is for the purchase of the asset. Uh, and obviously that corporate trustee, most banks insist that it only acts as trustee for the Bear Trust. So that being the case then, that uh, it's part of, the, um, part of the structure and the arrangement. So yes, the super fund can own it. And uh, just another question too, if you're changing the, uh, an asbestos roof um, to a new tile roof, is it a repair or improvement? Under tax law, it's an improvement, and that's how it's treated for tax law. Under the CIS legislation, however, that would actually be a repair. So once it's where you have this distinction between the two, between tax and CIS. So in that case, you could actually use borrow, you could actually use borrowed monies to remove that old roof and replace it with a new roof. So I suppose what I wanted to do there was just give a, a little bit of a quick uh, update, if you like, as to where we're at with the limited recourse borrowing arrangements. But I also just wanted to, I suppose, make people aware that there are other avenues in which you can buy property inside a, a self-managed super fund without actually needing to, to borrow. Now, I've got another seven uh, alternatives listed there. I'm not going to go through all of them because of uh, time permitting, but obviously if people want to uh, to talk about it, then um, I'm more than happy to do so. <clears throat> so essentially the first one to one to touch on is a non-geared trust. So some of you may be aware that when they brought in the in-house asset restrictions back in um, 99, they removed the ability to invest in certain types of trusts, but they still allowed what's called a non-gear trust. So under the uh, in-house asset provisions, there's a, basically a clause that says, unless otherwise permitted by the regulations. And those regulations are 13.22C of the CIS Act, obviously. <clears throat> now, what that means is because it's excluded from being an in-house asset, Related parties can own interests in the trust, 
The self-managed super fund can acquire more units in that trust at any point in time. Um, so it's very good for owning property. Now, these type of trusts, they're a normal unit trust, normal fixed trust. So in other words, financial statements, tax returns, that sort of thing need to happen. Now, there are a number of restrictions, however, on these type of trusts that are really important. So basically, to be qualifying as a 1322C trust, the trust must not acquire an asset which has been owned by a related party in the previous three years, unless it's business real property. Now, that's an interesting point, because what that essentially means is that the super fund, if, um, let's say that I owned a property, I sold it to my next door neighbour, and then six months later, my self-managed super fund bought that property off my next door neighbour, that's allowed, because I have not acquired it from a related party, assuming the next door neighbour obviously isn't related. However, acquiring property via a 1322C trust, I couldn't do that because I have actually owned it within the last three years. Also, the trust must not lease the asset to related parties of the, of the super fund, once again, unless it's business real property. Now, these trusts, they cannot borrow. Even an overdraft can cause all sorts of dramas and essentially mean that the trust becomes an in-house asset, forcing the trustee of the, super, of the super fund to sell its interest in that trust. The trust cannot conduct a business, and all the transactions must be conducted on an arm's length basis. And finally, the trust must not invest or loan money to any other entities, whether related or not, and that also includes listed shares. So these type of trusts cannot own shares in BHP or Telstra. There's an absolute um, prohibition on that. So they are purely designed for property. And the reasons for it when, the, when they brought the legislation in was essentially for asset protection purposes. And finally, the asset of the trust must not be charged for any purpose. So once again, similar to super fund, except in, those rules have been replicated to, the, uh, to the, these type of trusts. So why go to the, the hassle, if you like, of buying a, a property inside one of these type of trusts? Well, essentially, you have the ability to reinvest your units. So there doesn't have to be a physical cash flow from the trust out to the benef to the beneficiaries. <clears throat> Further, if you have a situation, say, where um, you have um, a, super, a super fund and the members owning a property 50-50 each, over time, that super fund cannot acquire that remaining 50% from the members because that would be an acquisition from a related party. Under the, if that same property, however, was purchased via one of these non-geared trusts, then the super fund could actually acquire a greater interest in that, uh, in that um, property via the units in the trust. So it allows a lot more flexibility in that regard. <clears throat> the big disadvantages with those type of trusts, however, is they are extremely restrictive insofar as those rules that I mentioned or the exclusions that I mentioned, uh, including that um, just by having the bank account go into an overdraft situation. And for those that haven't seen it, that's what the pretty picture looks like. Um, really, it's not that dissimilar to how that bare trust structure uh, looks like. Now, taking an extension of the non-geared unit trust and incorporating the limited recourse borrowing arrangement rules, what you can actually do is use them in conjunction. So in other words, it is possible to have a limited recourse borrowing arrangement for the acquisition of units in a non-geared unit trust. So these are a great alternative for property developers because those rules that I mentioned in relation to um, uh, the rules I mentioned in relation to improving property don't apply to these type of trusts. So you can actually 
you can buy that three bedroom house, flatten it and build your 10 storey apartment tower inside a non-geared trust. Obviously the trust needs to get capital and one option would be to actually have the super fund obtain a loan to then invest into that trust. The downside obviously is that that property can't be used as security for any type of loan that may be used. So obviously the banks are very unwilling to lend uh, on that basis because they can't actually use that property as security. So that means that you as the member would need to have other assets that you can put up as security. And obviously need to be mindful of the carrying on business provisions with inside those 1322C uh, non-geared trusts because if, if you're deemed to be carrying on a business then essentially you'll fall foul of the in-house asset provisions. So once again, something that you need to obtain advice on. And how does that look? As you can see, it's a little bit more complicated now because we now have the lender still in green and we have the self-managed super fund there with the bear trust and also units in the non-geared unit trust. And taking that a step further, we can then have the situation where we have one self-managed super fund being the number one there with a bear trust arrangement we have another party acquiring units without borrowings, or maybe that other party has borrowings. doesn't really matter. It's not a self-managed fund, so we don't really mind what it does. And the other two self-managed funds I have depicted there, one has a loan and one doesn't. So as you can see, you can have a lot of different variants with these type of structures, and it doesn't matter if all those entities are related or not because that unit trust is essentially non-geared. And then finally, we have a situation where we have what's called an unrelated trust. So that's where it is a unit trust that technically under the law is not related to the self-managed super fund. Now, these are the ultimate type of um, structures when it comes to self-managed super funds because essentially they can do whatever they like. So those unit trusts, they can borrow, they can undertake any type of investment so long as they deem fit. And further, so long as the proceeds don't make their way back to the member directly or to one of their entities. So there have over the years, there's been a number of schemes, if you like, where a super fund will invest in a non-related trust, which will then find its way back to the member personally, either via a loan um, or an investment in one of their entities. All right, that's prohibited. So that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a situation where we have a say a trust where we have three people that are otherwise unrelated by blood or uh, association that invest in a in a trust to acquire a property so obviously the investment strategy still must allow that type of uh, investment so that's fine and one trap just to just to be mindful of in this situation is that depending on the activities of the trust then, and the ownership of it, it may actually be treated differently for tax purposes. So instead of it being treated as a trust, it may actually be treated as a company. So once again, if you get into that sort of territory, you need to seek professional advice so then you can uh, determine that you're, you're doing the right thing and you know what you're getting yourselves in for. Now I've mentioned before about that related party or that relationship. So a little bit more on that is that under the Superannuation Act or the CIS Act, there's this thing called Part 8 Associates. So essentially to be a Part 8 Associate, you must have control or significant influence of that trust. So I mentioned before about using the example of three people. So if we have three people there that um, they're, say they're all neighbours, they're not related, they have no other business or personal dealings, apart from the fact they live next door to each other, then that would be okay, so long as that neither of them or either neither of the people involved have a fixed entitlement to more than 50% of income or capital, and that no one essentially inf has significant influence over the decision making of the other parties. <clears throat> the thing to also bear in mind there is to look at the constitution of the um, corporate trustee, assuming there's one, to make sure that the company doesn't have the ability to change directorships and that sort of thing. 
So once again, it's something that you need to consider and seek advice on to make sure you're actually not only doing the right structure, but also that you're having the right documentation in place. Because as some of you will well know, everything about superannuation is all about the documentation. It's all about the detail. So it's more than just um, setting up an entity. You actually need to have a look at what do the clauses say uh, of the constitution. You know, you have to read the deed to make sure that it is actually the right type of deed and it does what you're actually wanting it to do. Now, part eight associate, just going through that. So essentially, it's by a blood relationship or a linear um, descendant and also a partnership. Uh, in a, so that might be, for argument's sake, where two people own a property jointly. That's actually a partnership under tax law. Uh, and also if um, they're involved in a company that um, the other party controls. And that can how, be how that structure looks essentially. So that's where you have the self-managed super funds investing into the unit trust. And as I mentioned, that unit trust can then go out and borrow money. Now banks are happy to do that. They will usually require a either a um, accountant or a legal sign-off that there are no related parties involved in the transaction and things like that um, to, to make sure that they're all comfortable with it. But so long as those self-managed super funds there uh, aren't related, then that's fine. Or even if they are, so long as only two of them are related, we have a 50% ownership. Remembering that legislation says you have to have more than 50%. So having 50% is not more than. Now, I know I've covered that off reasonably quickly, but that was the idea, is to sort of be a little bit thought-provoking in that there are different ways in which you can look to acquire property inside self-managed super, um, and also just a bit of an update about those limited recourse borrowing arrangements. Now, I do have a couple of questions here that I'll, um, I'll get to. Um, so multiple bear trusts in one SMSF, can they all have the same corporate trustee? Now, the bear trusts can all have the same corporate trustee, yes, that's not a problem at all. Uh, however, you can't actually have the same corporate trustee for the self-managed super fund and the bear trusts because you can't actually hold an asset beneficially for yourself, which is what you would be doing in that situation. So I have um, a client that has three or four limited recourse borrowing arrangements all with the same trustee uh, and obviously then a different corporate trustee for the self-managed super fund. <clears throat> um, I have a question here, acquiring a shopping centre on LRBA, bank borrowing 60%, shopping centre security related party 40%, members private uh, assets of security, is this structure okay and if so, how to detail with the securities? So. Look, essentially, uh, what you're talking about there is borrowing 60% 60, 60 from the bank and then 40% from a related party. Now, that is allowed um, prima facie, but where the, the tax office come from is they will say, if it wasn't for that related party transaction, would the, uh, would the transaction go ahead? So in other words, could you obtain that 40% finance from a bank as a second mortgage? If the answer to that is no, then you're on pretty dangerous ground and you would want to actually obtain a private ruling. Uh, because obviously if you're dealing with a shopping centre, you're probably dealing with a bit of income and you don't want any capital gains or the annual income from that property. Uh, basically being lost to non-arm's length income. You know, it may be the case that a bank might lend 20% uh, for, uh, for the sort of um, top up. So one, one bank does 60%, another bank does 20% for the second mortgage, uh, which means then the super fund needs to find that extra 20% by contributions or uh, some other means, essentially. Um, but I'd be hesitant to do 100% borrowings inside a self-managed super fund uh, 
um, because of the um, the tax officer's position. Now they do actually have a couple of papers they released um, just before Christmas last year. Um, so I think they're um, ATO IDs 2014. Uh, I can't remember the exact numbers. Um, but if you would like me to send them through to you, more than happy to do so. Um, just um, shoot us an email and I can uh, I can send them through. Uh, and one final question is, um, can the property be used as security? Now I'm not exactly sure what that relates to. If that's in relation to the non-geared unit trust, then yes, it certainly can. Um, sorry, if it's in relation to the unrelated unit trusts. So the unrelated unit trusts, yes, the property can be used as security. The non-geared, no, it can't. And the limited recourse borrowing arrangements, yes, it can. So it really depends exactly on your uh, on your situation there. Um, sorry, and he's just clarified that. So yes, so the situation we have the four self-managed super funds holding 25% each. So that was the unrelated party example I gave. Yes, that property can be used as security because it's just like a normal uh, loan in a trust or a company or any other transaction that didn't involve a superannuation fund whatsoever. So, um, so yes, you can do that. Uh, and look, I think that's all the questions that um, have come through. Um, but look, by all means, if you do have any further questions or uh, you'd like some more information in relation to uh, either limited recourse borrowing arrangements or the other alternatives that um, are available using um, any of the structures that I've mentioned or even the ones that I didn't cover on, uh, by all means, uh, drop, uh, drop us a, an email or uh, give us a call and um, more than happy to, uh, to have a chat with you and, uh, and look at, the, at your situation. So unless there's any further questions, uh, I will leave it there. And um, thank you very much for your time this afternoon and have a great day. Cheers.